University of Technology. So good evening and welcome to the latest in Swin the Swinburne Chancellor's Lecture Series, this evening titled Journalism in the Digital Age. It's going to be a stimulating and lively discussion tonight and how could it be otherwise considering the quality of the people who are going to be speaking to us tonight. I'm thrilled to be here tonight because I studied here at Swinburne before I became a journalist. <clears throat> it was Swinburne which helped me hone my critical thinking and writing skills, skills which I used every day of my journalism career. It was at Swinburne that I first had my work published in a national magazine and I've been delighted to give back to Swinburne as a member of the uh, Governing Council for the past seven years. The format tonight will be that each of our speakers will have seven minutes to address the topic, journalism in the digital age. And then we'll have 30 minutes for discussion and you're invited, in fact you're actually expected to participate. We're anticipating a lot of questions to the panel members so please don't hold back when you get the chance and we're going to wrap up at quarter to eight. But first you should hear from our Chancellor, Bill Scales. Swinburne considers itself extremely fortunate to have Bill, Ch Bill Scales as the head of our governing council. As a university of technology there's a wonderful symmetry in having him as our Chancellor because he exemplifies the philosophy of lifelong learning. For Bill began his, began his work as a fitter and turner in the western suburbs of Melbourne. Then he went to uh, Monash University where he completed his economics degree. After 25 years in manufacturing, Bill went on to become a highly regarded public servant as one of the key people behind the Button Car Plan and the former chair and CEO of the Productivity Commission. Among his other influential roles, Bill was the former secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet here in Victoria. He was also a former group managing director at Telstra. More recently, Bill was one of the four member panel appointed to conduct the federal government's review of higher education. Currently, Bill, in addition to his role as Chancellor, is the chair of the Port of Melbourne Corporation. He's a member of the Board of ANSTO, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. He's a member of the advisory board of Viola Australia, a member of the federal government's expert reference group advising it on regulation for the higher education sector, and he's a member of the Council of the Victorian Division of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. You can see why we are indeed fortunate to have him here tonight. I'm surprised he has the time himself. But ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome the Chancellor of Swinburne, Mr Bill Scales. Thank you, Cathy, and uh, can I welcome everybody th to this of the fourth of the Chancellor's Lecture Series. It's really terrific to see so many staff and so many alumni and so many of the friends of the university here again to participate in what will be, once again, an outstanding lecture by some wonderful uh, Australians. As many of you would know, we started these lecture series at the year of our centenary, uh, in 2008. Uh, we started these series because what we wanted to do was to make sure that at least twice a year the university was able to convey not only to itself uh, but also to the wider community about how important it was to raise the profile about important subjects not only facing the university and the university community but also the broader Australian community. And tonight's uh, topic, of course, is no exception to us trying to raise the temperature, raise the profile on a very important subject. Tonight's event will be just as compelling as all of the others that many of you have been to. However, instead of having just one guest lecturer tonight, we're privileged to have three panellists who will be discussing the future of journalism in the digital age. All are prominent Australian media identities with decades of experience between them. They are passionately concerned with advancing the best of journalistic practices and exploring new models for supporting journalism that matters in this digital age. The development of the internet, of course, and the World Wide Web has, as most of you obviously know, transformed the publishing landscape in the past 20 years and has led to proliferation of all sorts of information. It's brought new reach, new speed and new voices to the world of journalism. Swinburne will play its role in facing the challenges brought about by these changes in the media industry. The University has introduced a new journalism degree this year 
to train students in the skills required in the new media landscape. It's an outstanding course, oversubscribed, and if you want to recommend to your uh, children, those who have children, where to study journalism, this is the place. <laughs> Swinburne also now houses the Public Interest Journalism Foundation, of which our three guests are, in fact, members. This not-for-profit foundation was established last year to help develop new ways to fund and support journalism. It will support investigative, interactive journalism while exploring ways of making good journalism sustainable in the new media age. The chair of the Public Interest Journalism Foundation, Margaret Simmons, is that will be our first presenter. Margaret is an award-winning journalist and author of eight books and numerous essays and articles and a frequent contributor to Crikey. She's also a lecturer here at Swinburne in the Our Journalism course. Margaret will discuss how social media is changing journalism and the community and explain the purpose of the Public Interest Journalism Foundation. Our second presenter will be Jonathan Green. Jonathan has been a journalist since the late 1970s. He's just a mere boy, really. He's currently editor of the new ABC online opinion and, and, and analyst and uh, site The Drum. He's the former editor of Crikey. He's also worked at the Melbourne Herald, the Sunday Herald, and as the senior editor at The Age. Jonathan will discuss how the ABC is transforming its news and current affairs to the new world order. Our final presenter is Steve Harris. Steve is a media profession, professional with 30 years experience. He's the former CEO of The Age, and a senior Fairfax Media and News Limited executive in both Melbourne and in Sydney. Steve will discuss the <coughs> traditional media's challenges and its opportunities in the new media age. I think it's true to say that never before has there been so much media choice and debate over the need for quality information and I think our three panellists are well placed to discuss the challenges that journalism faces in this time of great change and great challenge. So ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn it over to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and there's a um a relative newcomer to the Swinburne community. It's, it's a great pleasure to be addressing it. Um, as the first speaker tonight, I'd like to invite you to think broadly and fundamentally about the changes that we're considering tonight. Because it's not only a matter of whether you're still going to be picking up a piece of dead tree off your front lawn in the morning <laughs> and reading ink on paper over your cornflakes. It's much more fundamental than that. Uh, technological innovation, whether we face it or not, has always had a profound impact on just about every aspect of society, including how we learn, how we think, and what we think about. Take the invention of the printing press back in the 1400s. It took some time, but over time, that innovation changed just about everything. It changed democratic forms. It changed ideas of the nation state. It changed religion, with the Bible able to be printed and read widely for the first time and the ideas of Martin Luther, distributed through the 1500s, altered forever the power relationships of Western society. It ended a great deal of superstition, and it began the idea of the distribution of reliable information that had a life apart from the teller of that information. Indeed, we had the beginning of the idea of objectivity, if not the reality. And by the 1700s, of course, the products, the products of the printing press had led to the beginnings of my profession, of journalism. <clears throat> the job of professional messenger wasn't new, that it had existed ever since human societies grew big enough not to be able to know themselves through word of mouth alone. But previously, messengers had been in the employ of the powerful, governments and merchants, town criers and messenger boys. With the press came the idea of the conveyors of news who served other ends, certainly the commercial ends of the proprietor, who was often also the journalist, um, but also the public interest, which back then, as now, largely meant what the public was interested in, including a fair bit of scandal and titillation. But by the 1700s, as the material of the, from the printing press helped spur revolutions and civil revolt, 
And as Thomas Jefferson, writing the American Constitution, proclaimed the importance of the freedom of the press, there grew another idea of the public interest. The idea that there were some things that people needed to know or to be able to find out in order to be effective citizens in a democracy and that it was part of the role of journalists to find things out and tell people about them. Basic ideas, but two roles I would suggest that whatever else changes, we still need. But everything else is changing. I think we're living through a technological innovation that is at least the equivalent of the printing press. And over time, it will change just about everything in ways we find it hard to conceive now. There were several centuries between Gutenberg's printing press and the invention of the newspaper, and between the French and American revolutions and the English Civil War and that invention, but the speed of change is quicker these days. But nevertheless, we are only right at the beginning of the changes that it will bring. And since journalism is largely a byproduct of the last big technological innovation, we have to expect it to be affected. And indeed, it could be over, since now for the first time in human history, almost anyone can publish news and views to the world. Yet at the same time, there have never been so many opportunities for new ways to inform citizens, new ways to find things out, new and healthier and more interactive relationships between journalists and audiences. So why do I say that my profession might be over? And I don't think it is, by the way, but I would say that, wouldn't I? It's not because people don't want news anymore. It's because the business model is broken, or at, deep, at least under stress. When I started my career at the age 30 years ago, taxis used to queue up outside the back door to get the classified adverts still warm from the press. And when they bought the classified adverts, of course, they also got Michelle Grattan and me. Um, well, they were more interested in Michelle Grattan. Well, really, they were more interested in the classifieds, perhaps. Um, but the, the, these days, the link between the journalism and the advertisements has been broken. You can now go looking for a job or a car or a flat without ever encountering Michelle Grattan. And indeed, you can encounter Michelle Grattan without having a great weight of paper that you're not particularly interested in. Um, and, of course, those classified ads have disappeared online, hand over fist. Even with display advertising, you can't charge the same amount of money, anything like the same amount of money, for a display ad online as you can in a printed newspaper. Commercial TV news, which is still the place where most Australians get their news and information, relies on a different model, slightly different, gathering a large audience in one place at one time and selling their attention to advertisers. And now the audience is in many places at once, and there are many more channels. And as research from Swinburne here, the World Internet Project has shown, people who have internet access at home quickly begin to watch less television. So we could lose newspapers and broadcasters as big employers of journalists. But as I said, let's be clear where the crisis is and where it isn't. It isn't in people's appetite for news and information. It is in the business models. People's appetite for news and information is a constant. Every human society ever studied, news has been important. Human beings, ever since they spoke, have probably said to each other on meeting, what's news, or words to that effect. Which means, I believe, that new business models will emerge, and new methods of supporting the function of journalism, even if we call it something else, and even if it's done by many more people, will emerge. And this is why I tell the students enrolled in our new journalism professional degree here at Swinburne, not the despairing message, I've had it good, pity about you, <laughs> but rather, you will reinvent it. This is your time. You are the media. But along the way, people like me, old ladies, have learned a few things that may be useful in your journey. <coughs> so what are we doing here at Swinburne, apart from giving young people the skills and insights they'll need to inform the citizens of the future? Well, the Foundation for Public Interest Journalism, already mentioned, founded last year, has a wide brief under university statutes to explore, in conjunction with the industry, positive uses of new media for journalism. <coughs> One of our new experimental projects, which we'll launch in a few weeks, is called UCOM News. It's something which would never have been possible with old technology. It's a website that will allow the audience to directly commission the journalism they want to see. 
Ideas can be pitched on a site by journalists or by any member of the community or by any media organisation. And then if people want to see that idea researched and the journalism is done, they can donate money, amounts of $20 or more, crowdsourcing the funding. And if the money is collected, the journalism will be done and published, well, everywhere and anywhere because, unlike the age of Gutenberg, publication is no longer the problem. It's the financing of the journalism that's the problem. This is a pro-am collaboration model, journalists in direct relationships with their audiences, funded by the Department of Industry, Innovation and Regional Development and private philanthropists, and you will be hearing a lot more about it very soon now. We're also organising, in conjunction with the Melbourne Writers' Festival, a two-day conference, expo and industry fair as part of the Melbourne Writers' Festival this September. It will be attended by leading figures from the industry and it will bring this issue of where journalism is going and what that's going to do to us to the heart of cultural Melbourne. And as a long-term project, we have plans for a resource centre that will preserve and pass on some of the trade skills of the investigative journalist, while at the same time researching and experimenting with what new relationships are possible in this age between content makers and their audiences. And for that matter, between those who govern and those who are governed. It's an exciting and a frightening time. I imagine the monks in the monasteries of Europe who were suddenly confronted with Gutenberg's printing press felt something like we feel now. What will happen to authority? What will happen to learning? What will happen to our jobs? What will happen to our idea of civilization? There's no doubt that we're going through a bloody and difficult time in news media and there's no doubt that it will continue for some years yet. But in the long term, I expect to see many more outlets, probably smaller, perhaps less profitable than those we have now, but in a direct and interactive relationship with the community. They will be humbler, perhaps, and that may be no bad thing. And individually, they may be less powerful, but as a whole, it may well be a power such that we've never seen before. I think we're living at the end of the imperial age in media. The great empires of the past are dead, like Kerry Packer. <laughs> or are old men, like Rupert Murdoch. And like all post-colonial ages, this one will throw us more on our own resources. It will be messy and confusing, and we may miss the things the emperors used to do for us. But it will be exciting as well. And it's very exciting to have the opportunity to play a small part in this change. Thank you. I'm Jonathan and I'm from the ABC and I'm here to help. <laughs> There's certainly a lot going on. Oh, but by the way, who's live tweeting? Anybody? Oh, look at you. <laughs> See, new media in the flesh, it's not to be feared. There's a lot going on at the moment in, in our little business of media and information. Um, and I don't think um, that all of it's bad. I think a lot of it's extremely positive. I think a lot of it gives us tremendous cause for optimism and hope. But it is definitely certain that the sort of the, the big empirical business models that, that Margaret refers to are in, in some strife. And it's not because people are walking away in terms of circulation, it's because, which is happening to some extent, but it's because the money is disappearing. The money that used to fund the journalism. And this has always been a very peculiar rela relationship and, and one that goes back only back to sort of the mid-19th century when people realised that uh, rather than charging a high cover price for stuff that was printed and contained journalism and stories, they could reduce that price, get advertising, increase the numbers. And so a sort of a, a strange but uneasy relationship developed. Um, and, and people have never, as a result of this uneasy relationship, um, actually had to pay for the stuff that journalists produced. Um, the, you know, the, this, this thing of the, the papers like The Age and The New York Times and The Sydney Morning Herald and so forth have produce great journalism on the back of itty bitty ads for motorbikes. Um, so this sort of rhetoric you hear now um, about making people pay for news from the, the likes of Rupert Murdoch and so on is kind of a novelty, at least in sort of recent memory. There's figures out today and we know that there's, I saw an iPad over here before and it's currently in furious use. <laughs> 
nobody ring him because it doesn't actually work like that. <laughs> <laughs> Figures today, there would be something like two million of these things, I think, flogged around the world so far. Um, and a lot of big newspaper proprietors, certainly the big ones in this country and, and elsewhere, are seeing this as the hope of the side, that finally they will have uh, a, a means of delivering their product and, and, and monetising that delivery. Two million iPads sold up to this morning, 4,500 applications for the Australian's iPad app thing has been sold at $4.99 a month. That's a, a monthly revenue to um, News Limit of $22,455. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Rupert's cracked it there. Uh, the, the, the Times, I think, which is a somewhat more august journal, has managed to sell double that at their their price of seventeen pounds or seventeen dollars equivalent a month. So you know that it's money there, but this stuff is not the answer. Paying for the content is not necessarily the answer to the thing. But it's not just that. Uh, thing I think of sustaining the business models that's kind of the issue. I think there are some cultural issues in journalism that are problematic as well. Um, and a lot of people say that you know journalism is the only sort of answer to these problems of, of public interest and, and public information and the sort of the fourth estate function. But in a lot of instances our journalism works in a pretty uh, decrepit and dysfunctional and um, you know, self-serving way even at its sort of nobler extremes, if you look at things like the Federal Parliamentary Press Gallery, this is, this is a group of people who hunt as a pack, who haven't turned over a, a, you know, a good news story to save themselves in a period of time. Even when they do, when they, they pursue agendas which are you know, particular to their corporate interests or their, the political interests of their corporations, even when you do have an organisation, for example, the campaign of stories that The Australian has recently run on the building the educational revolution issues, it's dismissed by much of the media as just being this sort of thing that the uh, Australian had dreamt up with the Liberal Party. Well, in fact, there was a story there, but it was because of this sort of you know, political bias and this sense of this overwhelming political interest on the part of the people that first published it, people kind of walked away from the story, but there was something real there. But this sort of instinct of journalism was being betrayed on one part and sort of set aside on another. And this is an example, you know, there are many examples. The Kens of Kensington affair in, in New South Wales with, you know, TV crews stalking guys outside sex clubs. This is not journalism prosecuting anything other than public prurience. And that happens a lot. Journalism may not be the hope of the side. And a lot of the rhetoric around this discussion of new media and business models and where we're going to get to and you know, how this nourishes a democracy places this extraordinary faith in journalism as the thing that has to be sustained, as the thing that we have to find ways of funding and you know, is, is the one thing that can carry us forward in the new age. And I think that's true to some extent. And there are great things in the craft of journalism um, uh, which it would be tragic to lose. But one of the wonderful things about what's happening in digital media is that there is uh, a whole lot of information now available from people in non-traditional areas of practice. Um, there are very capable economists in Queensland that run blogs that crunch the numbers on all sorts of things in the political sphere. Some of the best writing you will read informing public discussion in this country is not from journalists. It's not from traditional news organisations or news sources. It's out there being done on the back of other people's, you know, other, other earnings, on the back of day jobs by people with significant interest. But it is still sort of pro providing this really valuable role uh, in informing the community and in informing debate in a way that's probably better than it's been for a long time. There has this is a moment where uh, there is probably better commentary, better analysis in big public events and big public issues being delivered now than there has been in many, many, many years. Um, we no longer have the, you know, the situation where we had one or two major newspapers um, trotting out there four or five people delivering the only sort of analysis of, of public events that was available. This is now broader. This has been disseminated and it's coming from non-traditional sources. The other thing that's interesting and healthy in the Australian um, information and, and journalistic culture at the moment is the role of the public broadcaster. Um, and in a time when the, as we say, as we've seen and, and know, the business models of the big commercial journalistic outfits are under stress, 
uh, this role, which is the great good fortune in this country of having um, a robust public broadcaster. Uh, and not only a robust public broadcaster, but one with a particular emphasis on news and current affairs, which is what the ABC currently has, uh, is, is a tremendous blessing. Um, this is not one that is shared in a lot of other um, you know, democratic structures in this world. Uh, when it is in other countries, it can often be you know, far more state polluted um, than it is in this country. In this country, it is, uh, this was uh, you know, illuminating and surprising to me as someone who's only worked within the ABC since late last year, but it is one of the most robust, um, fair, even-minded, uh, traditionally rigorous journalistic cultures than I've encountered in a very, very long time. It's one which almost sort of polices that rigour um, to an annoying extent, but it, it does so in a way that um, a lot of other media outlets, media outlets that have had to chase the bums on seats, that have had to chase sensationalism, that have sort of faced their declining revenues and their declining readerships with this constant um, thirst for sensation and just numbers and bums on seats, which is what's had to happen to a lot of newspapers and uh, you know in, in the last sort of 20 years or so, and diverting their journalistic strength into areas that don't provide quality news and information but just make money. This doesn't happen to that extent. Well, you know, the ABC doesn't chase revenue. The ABC can um, produce and, and pursue things for you know purely journalistic interest, and it does so. And it's expanding that activity um, without wanting to you know, sound like their PR guy. That's a, a tremendous asset in a, in a democracy like ours. And it, and it you know, provides a really, I think, fundamental service. Um, it's not an answer to the issues that are besetting journalism. Um, but as I say, I think there is, there is balance in this emerging reality, this exciting period where a million flowers are blooming um, where journalism in the next decade or two may not be the be all and end all of how stuff is investigated, explored, explained um, and disseminated. Um, that's been the sort of, uh, because of the accident of how you know, these products and this business has developed in the last century or so, that's been the, the sort of accidental thing is that journalism has grown up with it and become the sort of mainstay, but that's changing. Um, different structures revolving and different people are getting involved in that informational game. Thank you and welcome everybody. The price of coming third is that some of this may seem achingly familiar. <laughs> so just humour, humour me and pretend you're hearing it for the first time. But I don't think there's any doubt that um, every day we're seeing evidence of mega shifts in our lives in power, economics, values, entertainment, communications. They're all changing, uh, but more importantly, they're changing in speed and complexity and interdependence. But a shared DNA of all of them, I think, is this industrial revolution of data and information, the going digital. It's a real biggie because, as Margaret alluded to, it's this digital revolution is part of all those mega shifts. And secondly, man's intellectual progress and measurements for 500 years has been paper-based. So I think as we consider the future for journalism or newspapers or other bastions of journalism, it's important to understand the broader narrative going on, which is as human as much as technological or economic. A little part of that narrative, it's only 150 years ago last month was the celebration of the day when Johnny Fry left St Joseph, Missouri on horseback and in his pack he had 49 letters and five telegrams. And he teamed up with 100 other riders, changing on 75 horses every 15 clicks or so to link Missouri with California. It was a revolutionary shrinkage of time and distance and a quickening of speed, a revolution. It became legendary. It only lasted 18 months, but no one forgets it. Since then there's been a bunch of other revolutions like the telegraph, radio, television, photocopier, fax machine, computer and internet. But now we have the overnight sensation of this industrial revolution of in digital data and media, with whole new levels of shrinking distance and time and quickening of speed. Facebook, probably six years old, now has 40 billion photos on it. The amount of unique new information generated worldwide this year is more than double the previous 5,000 years. That's just this year. The amount of new information is said to be doubling every two years, and some saying by the end of this year, it'll be every 72 hours. 
Walmart handles a million customer transactions an hour, adding to its databases every hour an estimated 167 times the total number of books in the Library of Congress, every hour. And every Twitter missive since 2006, including the ones being emitted tonight, are archived and searchable at the Library of Congress. This is part revolution with all its uncertainties and part gold rush with all its irrationality. And I think some of the broader narrative about the state of and the future of journalism in the digital age goes to this. Having 247 access to anyone, anytime, anything is empowering and energising and fun, but I think there's a but. We have more information and media drowning over us than ever before, yet people are still thirsting for insight, clarity, direction, connectedness, control, even hope. Technology is making media more powerful, but that makes it less powerful as anyone can create and be media, as Meg and Jonathan referred to. And as media rises in ubiquity and the relative cost declines, so those aspects of media which are unique and perhaps of higher value are those most at risk. So do the journalism. Well, the bad news is we now have fewer professional journalists spending less time in research and discovery, filling fewer pages and broadcast hours on ever-reducing numbers of newspapers, magazines and current affairs programs to smaller audiences with ever-declining profits to the owners and, I think, with declining influence. Some quick examples. Newsweek's future is now in serious question, despite a recent revamp. The biggest investigative newsroom in the world today is not the New York Times, it's ProPublica, an independent, non-for-profit organisation. Gannett, which is the number two newspaper chain to Rupert's News, made half a billion dollars profit last year. Seems impressive. It was 7% of what Google made. <laughs> the good news, I think, is that much of the journalistic and newspaper pressures were evident before the digital devils surrounded the journalism cathedrals or the kingdoms, as Margaret referred to them. <laughs> Underscoring us, the function of journalism is more the issue than the form of delivery. Pre the digital, we were already seeing the costs to journalism of corporatism, short-termism, greed, arrogance, lack of adaptability, competitive alternatives, and the declining economics. We were already seeing the costs of an incremental shift from news to information to infotainment to entertainment not to mention the spin and manufactured co conflict and demonisation that we see too much of today. <coughs> so digital did not cause journalism disease, it merely fast-tracked the pressure questions of distance, time and viability at turbo speed. So is it a crisis? In the Greek origin of the word krisi, it's a sense of a turning point in a disease, a decisive moment towards improvement or deterioration. Newspapers are diseased, deteriorating, as is journal journalism as we have known it as in mostly employed by big print newspaper, magazine and broadcast companies. But digital is equally offering a turning point for individual journalists and outlets who are competent and courageous enough to focus unambiguously on what they can do that impacts and benefits an audience and simply do it better than anyone else. We hear those in charge of journalism focus on digitising and monetising content, paywalls, optimising content for search engines, which is code for ad bait. That's understandable if you're looking through a commodity lens, but I think less so if the lens is more about making your content more relevant, valuable, engaging and impactful. That's about optimising original content and value for searching individuals. In simplistic terms, journalism is not another commodity, which is ubiquitous, replicable, largely forgettable. Journalism is what is capable of improving individual and community knowledge and understanding, providing some bearings and improving our capacity for participation in community and society. It is discoverage rather than reportage, and most valuable when it's connected to the public interest of a given community. It's valuable as a guide dog and as a watchdog. As a guide dog by helping us better understand and navigate our way through the increasing complexities of life. And ask yourselves, how much journalism have you read recently or heard recently which helped you better understand climate change, terrorism, population growth, financial meltdown, immigration, healthcare, local planning issues? It's also valuable as a watchdog, telling us what we don't know or what others don't want us to know, telling us about the underlying intentions and consequences of what government, business or individuals are doing, to instil some fear of public exposure, embarrassment, loss of employment or reputation, economic cost or even criminal prosecution for those not meeting public interest standards. The problem is that such journalistic endeavour has always been the most uneconomic element of Media Inc, subsidised until now by often mon monopolistic advertising now eroded, as we've heard. So the core journalism has become a cost control lever, not a value enhancing lever. 
The question is whether enough people think good journalism is a value enhancer. That just like perhaps good air, water, safety, education and health, we need good journalism to sustain a healthy, engaged, fair and democratic society. Or that we might need good journalism in a world which seems often unfathomably complex, chaotic and irrational. Or that we need good journalism in a world where standards of leadership and accountability everywhere, including government, business, religion and sport, are so evidently lacking. If we agree there is a need, then to me there's an opportunity, although there'll be a lot of casualties and pain on the way. Technology provides extraordinary opportunities for journalists or groups working with journalists, such as cost efficiencies, crowdsourcing, geolocation-based information, visual information and so on. Also, as governments and business inevitably make more base information available, so this creates widespread opportunities to produce content from that that is of value to very specific audiences. More journalism will come from collaborations across journalists and like-minded organisations, and arguably the recent ABC Fairfax collaboration on the Reserve Bank story was one small example. Community groups and between enterprising universities who often have a lot of intellect and research without influence, and journalists who often have influence without intellect or research. <laughs> um, and public interest journalism will rise via start-up alliances. Recently a Bureau of Investigative Journalism was launched at its home at City University in London only last month involving journalists, the British Medical Journal, Channel 4, Al Jazeera and Philanthropy, an odd consortium, but I think indicative. Governments can and should help non-for-profit, public interest or community service journalism, whatever you want to call it, via policy and tax initiatives, just as they do now with education, heritage, arts and science. There will be opportunities in niche spaces and especially the very local spaces where enterprising journalists can become the epicentre, a clearinghouse, a leader, in ways well beyond what currently passes for local media. I think whether it's the town crier, the Pony Express, newspaper or wiki, the content questions are constant. What is relevant to the audience and their needs? What will be impactful and meaningful? Who will buy? What will last the distance? Where's the real value? I think such questions have always underpinned the future of journalism, digital age or not. Thank you very much. Thanks also to Margaret and uh, Jonathan. Well, now we get to the part of the evening where you get to participate. So I'm just looking to you, Melinda, where will the microphone be? If I could just remind you, because we're podcasting, so we need you when you ask your questions to uh, get the attention of one of the people holding the roving mics. And uh, if you could state your name, clearly direct to whom you uh, are he heading the question. And uh, if it's relevant, you could also um, state your organisation. So if you'd like to ask a question, you just want to uh, put your hand up, give an indication, and the microphones will be heading your way. Um, seeing this is public, perhaps I should just say I'm Jane Doe. Watch out, you Twitterers. <laughs> Don't point me in for any <laughs> trouble. Um, Jonathan, you were saying there that you had the idea that... Um, Someone with, sig someone with significant interest um, is being heard or could be heard more, so as a blogger, more so perhaps than, uh, than a journo, because they've got the public audience or the public ear or public eye uh, looking at the screen. So will we as a species um, dismiss public commenters or bloggers and actually go to the source, perhaps become a species that tunes into Parliament? to go to the source to find out more rather than listening to the bloggers? Is it possible at all that we might become armchair journalists at home, do our own investigating and find out really where the, the, the information is coming from? I think there's a great opportunity for that. Um, one of the points Steve made was that when was the last time you read good journalism that explained um, stuff on climate change and so forth and so on, various subjects. It may be true of journalism, but I've read squillions of stuff out there on the internets um, in the blogosphere that provide a great illumination in those subjects and a lot of it's going to the source. Um, every afternoon during a parliamentary sitting um, at my little thing at the ABC we do a stupid live tweet participatory thing around question time with the House of Reps and people sit there in their living rooms watching video feeds of questioning, question time and putting up their commentary, putting in their sort of input to this discussion. Um, you notice it around, say, the ABC's Q&A program, same phenomena of people engaging through social media and, you know, chipping in on a, 
um, on, a, on a piece of, of political performance, I guess. Um, but the other, the other opportunity is there too, to use the tools that are available now, to use the sort of increasingly apparent paths to information um, to access it for yourself and make up your own mind and to read broadly around things both you know, in primary and secondary sources that don't necessarily need the filter of journalism in a lot of instances now. I mean, I think what we're seeing is not only the collapse of these business models, but this a slight erosion, I reckon, on the authority and necessity of the journalistic role. Um, you can do, an intelligent person can do a lot of them themselves these days. What is that on that? I think um, in the past, the sort of uh, this so-called uh, holy go grail for journalism was objectivity. I, I think the new, the new black is transparency. Who want to know what is the source and where does it come from and who's had an influence over it and what's really going on? So I think the transparency argument is, is, now, is now the killer application, if you like, which goes to some of the things you're alluding to. Yeah, I'm just looking for a quote from the panel, um, probably particularly Margaret, um, on Catherine Devaney's career <laughs> <laughs> thus far. Uh, kind of uh, to the, her, her recent sacking, but also uh, if you look back on her career, kind of like the way she wrote towards the end is certainly different from the way that she wrote at the start. And um, Steve, I think you mentioned the difference between kind of like being informative to being infotainment. Kind of. The way that she, wore, she wrote towards the end, and I also um, do a few things, and one of them is being on 3CR community radio, 855 AM. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had her Trust on one that she's time, a journalist. <laughs> Uh, but there is a big difference between the way that she used to write and the way that she wrote towards the end. And no doubtedly, that was fuelled by the drive of the people that she was writing for. So, yeah, I'm just wondering if somebody could comment on that. Well, it's interesting I get this question because the man on my left is the one who um, first commissioned Catherine Davini for The Age many years ago. But um, nevertheless, I'll stand in for you, Jonathan, and, uh, and attempt <laughs> to answer the question. Um, um, she was nothing without me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, I think the interesting thing about what Catherine Davini did, which, you know, I have to say I thought was incredibly stupid and inappropriate, etc. But the interesting thing was to what extent does her relationship with her audience through Twitter, to what extent does that reflect on the idea of the masthead of the age, you know, the institution of the media, as opposed to an individual content maker's relationship with their audience. Um, and I think we're in the middle of a big shift there. I mean, what is the age other than the relationships <coughs> between its content makers and their audience, and also, I guess, the advertisers and their audience, and so on? Um, I would say it's less and less without those relationships, and that there's no real reason why the age should seek to own or control Catherine Davini's relationship with her audience. I say this as somebody who's not a fan, I have to say, of hers. And um, I wouldn't have thought it was necessary to sack her for what she did on Twitter, even though I thought it was, you know, in incredibly poor taste. Mm. The, the, the fact on, on that particular instance is, too, that the, the age created that persona. The age put this person out there. Well, I, I, hired, I hired her to write a series of stories about uh, her, her pregnancy and the birth of her child, which was an antidote to the, the columns that have been recently run on that subject by the wife of Andrew Bolt. Um, and it was, it was funny at the time. <coughs> but they wanted her to be sensational. They wanted her to put, you know, the bums on seats. And they, they removed the discipline that might normally attach to a writer in their masthead um, purely because she was being sensational and was being popular. And you kind of reap what you sow with that. Yeah, and then the minute she is, just steps over that line, and of course there is a line and she did step over it, but they sack her. It's... Um, yeah, you know, I just thought the whole thing was mishandled in many different ways. Okay, moving along. Hi, uh, my name's Jonathan. My question is um, a bit to, to Steve and also a bit to the whole panel. Um, we've heard a lot tonight about the paradigm shift between um, sort of the large, you know, corporations and, and those things. Um, I'm just interested to hear your views on uh, quality assurance. You know, if you buy The Australian, you know someone's, you know, these, these are professional journalists. Uh, and also from a corporate perspective that um, we've also got to accept that with that change, that paradigm shift, it might be uh, easier to get free journalism, but how are we going to keep paying journalists if, you know, News Limited can't sell newspapers? Um, how is that whole corporation going to keep 
keep that division up and running? Um, well, I think the issue you raised there is the one I think we've all alluded to, and that is the, uh, the money it takes to support that sort of journalism through advertising is declining faster than the amount of revenue upside on online or internet or iPad or anything else is increasing. So that's why you're going to have a lot of blood on the floor for the next five or ten years. That's why a lot of newspapers have already gone completely digital. Um, Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft, predicted two years ago that by 2020 there'd be no newspaper or magazine basically delivered in print. It's only ten years away. Now, he's since recanted a little bit, but I suspect in the next two years he's going to recant again and say, no, I was right the first time. Um, Christian Science Monitor, Monitor is now digital only. Well, 109 newspapers in America in the last year either went out of business or went to digital only. Now, a lot of these are small, hokey little papers, but for people to say it can't happen here are kidding themselves. Uh, the newspaper cemetery is full of papers that at the time thought they were doing a wonderful job. You know, Melbourne Herald, as one, the Argus, thought they were doing a wonderful job for the community at the time. Did I think the issue is an organ, <coughs> be it broadcast or newspaper, can have an air of authenticity about it, New York Times, whatever, Age, ABC, um, but they all bring their own biases in the sort of people they pick and the sort of subjects they pick and what they choose to follow up from other media and what they choose not to and what you know, agendas they're running. Um, and you've got to be intelligent enough to see through that, probably read more than one source to, to get it. But there's certainly still some value in it. Now, whether it's in print or broadcast form or in fibre optics down the track doesn't really matter. Uh, secondly, there'll be individual journalists within those organisations who will retain an authority well beyond those organs. And thirdly, there'll be a transparency argument, which I alluded to, we're under Government 2.0 or Business 2.0, whatever you want to call it, and this transparency argument that whatever the journalist is writing will increasingly have to be searchable and shareable and indexable, which gives you, the consumer, a lot more control over what you're actually getting and saying, I've actually gone back and read that original report that was in Parliament, and that's not quite what the main point was, in my view, or it overlooked X or it lacked context or whatever the case may be. So. Like all, all things in life, you'll get out of media as much as you put into it in terms of effort. If you want to be entertained, there's no shortage of it. You, know, you talk about Davini, I mean, it's, she's arguably the um, uh, Ackermanus of media. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you create an animal and then you punish the animal you've trained. Uh, you know, but, um, you know, I kind of think that uh, mainstream media in whatever form <coughs> outside of perhaps the ABC and others who aren't relying on commercial income uh, are in trouble. And that means the people on those payrolls, the 300 plus journalists at The Age or The Herald Sun, you know, increasingly going to be forced down the entertainment route as their sort of main way of delivering value for their wage, which is not what we're on about. Just to add a little bit to that, the, the metaphor of the post-colonial age you know, post-colonial ages put much more responsibility back on the citizens of the country. And, and that's everyone. Um, now, one of the questions that I'm interested in researching is given that uh, a lot of this sort of rhetoric assumes that citizens are all going to go home and sort of start mashing up data and, you know, reading parliamentary reports and so on, and we all know that's not going to happen, <laughs> right, <laughs> to everyone. Um, journalists have traditionally been one of the brokers, if you like. There have been others, public servants, librarians, you know, there have been other brokers in that role. Um, to what extent are the things that journalists have been doing still useful and what things that we've been doing aren't useful. And there certainly will be some that we can wave goodbye to, but some that we need to keep. OK, a few more hands coming up. Can I suggest that you uh, try to catch the eye of, the, of uh, Melinda with the microphone while the answers are, are, are happening? That way we're ready to go. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Tony Dibbenan's my name from my dear college, former age journalist. Uh, this is to the entire panel. Um, do you not think that the new journalism has also been responsible for dumbing down everything? That uh, everything now has to be in 10 second grabs or two pars? Uh, a. B. You say that everybody is now empowered, but what quality control is there on the, the net? There is none from what I can see, at least with the big organisations, large newspapers, at least you had some sort of quality control, some checks and balances. There don't seem to be any now. And that assumes that everybody's intelligent enough to sift through, and I suspect the education system has not really produced people who are intelligent enough to do that. Well, well going online is very like walking into a pub. You can choose to join the rowdy bunch in the corner over there or the interesting bunch of people having a civilised conversation over there, which is us, of course. Um, 
Um, but the difference is that they're all being broadcast, if you like, worldwide to everybody. And so a great deal of stuff that once would have stayed in the corner of the pub with a bunch of drunks is now public, and that's very disturbing to see. But so too is the intelligent bunch of people having the interesting conversation in the corner. Look at the camera up there, we're being podcast. Okay, it will be on the internet. Lots of people who aren't here tonight will be able to, if they wish, to see this. So um, in terms of quality control, I think social networking is both, is possibly part of the answer to this. Increasingly, social networking, Facebook, Twitter, is one of the main drivers of what young people choose to consume in media, not only news media, but across the, across the um, whole spectrum of media. And I think that trend is going to increase. And so if somebody that you know and trust, who's led you to good stuff in the past, suggests you look at something, you're more likely to. And I think that will become what we would now call quality control. But of course, what you're interested in will be quite different from what the rowdy bunch in the corner of the pub is interested in, and it will all be there. I think that the quality assurance stuff that's been mentioned a couple of times that is sort of vested in the big traditional media organisations, I mean, that's, that's really pretty overstated. And as one of the first casualties of the sort of the cuts and, and trimmings that took place um, in, in mainly newspapers in the last couple of decades, and one of the first casualties in their sort of constant search to find new revenue streams and, you know, deploy their journalism outside of the assurance kind of roles and into the money roles. And the other thing is that um, the internet is, is kind of an interesting market. I mean, the, the, the ideas that float around there, um, uh, the better stuff floats to the top. Um, the stuff which has la lacks credibility is, is often found out by the, you know, the people that access it and surround it. And these communities are active. They do talk to each other. There is a sort of a shared sense of what has value and what doesn't. Um, I think you can place great trust in you know, some of those sort of organic processes online. I also think, Tony, there's um, the transparency that you see with uh, academic research where there's an article and there's a whole bunch of citations. I mean, that's kind of the direction that journalism has to go in. You know, the anonymous sources, they're, they're kind of over. Um, because there's nothing that government or business shouldn't be producing that shouldn't be available to anybody. Or the PR that's, sources and the spin yeah, sources. and that's and the, the way the world is going. Everything will be available to everybody. You know, with, with a few exceptions, obviously, for national security or commercial and confidence. But it means if... It's not that long ago journalists were reluctant to even say they had shares in a business they were actually reporting on. Now you see the little footnotes on the bottom saying, I've got shares in Telstra. So there's been small steps, but taking a long time to come, let alone I work for a company that's got this agenda. I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> but you've got to work your way through it. But I think the more transparency there is in the reportage and the more you can cross-reference what you've read against something else you've read, that's your quality assurance. It's in the eye of the, in the, eye of the consumer. Hi, it's uh, Kevin Jones from the Safety at Work blog. I'm a freelancer. I've been freelancing and blogging for two years, <clears throat> and uh, in mainly in health and safety. But we're getting we're getting there, and we're getting good numbers. Um, I don't consider myself to be a journalist, um, although the journalism union, the uh, alliance, says I'm a journalist, and that's what it says on my ticket. <coughs> um, I'm just wondering, when you're talking about journalism, do you see that as a profession? or do you now see it as an activity? The, la the latter, and increasingly. I think it is an activity, and I think in the future it will be more widely and more thinly spread, if you like. There will be many people, perhaps such as yourself, who do the function of journalism for part of what they do or part of their life. But I do also think that there will still be a need for people who are paid to do the journalistic function, because while many citizen journalists will do things that they're interested in or that they're passionate about, the hard and dirty work of journalism, the reporting of courts, the reporting of parliaments, the ringing people up and making them cross with you um, on topics that you're not passionate about or even particularly interested in, people won't do that consistently for free. And so while I do think it will be, there will be many people who are performing the function of journalism and journalism will become more of a uh, practice than a profession, um, I don't think the profession will entirely disappear. But it's, it's only been, it's only perceived of itself as a profession in the last sort of 20 years. I mean, when I started and, well, 
You know, I started this in, in, in 78 or so and I've got no degree. I was never trained in this other than doing a three-year apprenticeship on the job. And that's the way people did it at, at that time. And in my working life, it has, uh, the money that journalists get has, has, has gone up vastly. Their expectations of it as a, as a career have also escalated significantly. Um, their sense of sort of professional standing in the world has, has grown like topsy. And I think that's... It's one of the things that will change. It's a bit like... Um, I don't think that will mean that people won't do it. And it's a bit like um, playing football. If suddenly the money was pulled out of football and people sort of had to do it well, as they used to do traditionally, working at the butchers on the Saturday morning, they'd still keep doing it. There'd be a period of dislocation, but the, the trade of playing footy would continue. I, I agree with what they said. I think the activity will become finer and finer. I mean, whether you're a general journalist or a sports journalist or a political journalist, uh, you can now divide each of those you know, umpteen times and there'll be visual journalists and there'll be uh, who specialise in simply taking complex information and trying to put it into a visual form. So there'll be different skill sets under the loose term of journalism, but as evidence of where things are going, the freedom of information legislation, which we're all familiar with here, but in the States they had a problem where uh, the cost of the applications was getting out of control, so they asked Congress to review the laws as to who should get this stuff? And of course, it was mainly meant to go to journalists because they'd be the ones agitating for it. And they said, well, define a journalist today. So they did. And it basically says anyone who produces information for somebody else, <laughs> which basically means every citizen in the United States is now capable of filing an FOI application. Yeah. That's going to get out of control. But that's kind of where things are going. Oh, it's Steve Grahams from that. Probably a question for the other Steve up there. Um, it's about how to. How does a government govern? Because if the, with the diminution of um, journalism, it's reduction of knowledge and information. And if more and more people are more concerned about what happened on MasterChef on television tonight and then read about it tomorrow, and there's no discussion of do we put a fast train from Melbourne to Brisbane or a water pipeline or do we increase defence or buy warships, how on earth does a government govern? Um, I'm intrigued. Is it going to lead to a better government or worse government? I, I don't think, from what I see, politicians don't like working in a vacuum. They like to read the play, so... <laughs> they're already part way there, so... I don't know what the answer is. Politicians like to read what the cheer squad has to say. Um, I think government will get increasingly harder. They're under more pressure to produce more information and make it more transparent what they're doing, and inevitably that is happening. Um, which, in a sense, makes it harder because then you get people more informed, which means they're going to ask more questions, which governments don't like because they're a control model. Um, but also I think that, uh, and government I think will become less influential, to be frank, in the same way as empires of journalism will become less influential, I think government itself will become less influential, and is now. I mean, federal and state governments aren't in control of half, half the things they're allegedly in control of. You know, look at the financial markets, a glaring recent example. Um, they're in charge of national security, but tell that to the boat people, and the refugees. So. I think they'll become less influential on one hand and much more complex, which is why there'll be a whole bunch of new power entities develop. And I think it's a, a fantastic opportunity for universities because uh, if you look at all the institutions that have lost power bases, churches, clearly not what they used to be, trade unions, not what they used to be, media empires, not what they used to be, governments, I think, not what they used to be. There's nowhere near the respect and interest for government leaders as <coughs> they used to be. So you could argue that academia is about the last bastion left that's based on credible research and authenticity and independence, non-commercial objectives, largely, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, it's a fact of life, Ian, we know that. But, um, but I think, really, as I was saying earlier, you know, the alliances between like the City University in London and other groups to say, we have independent research, we can get journalists or whatever you want to call them, they can help transform that into content that goes to an audience we want, plus the technology is enormously powerful. Maybe just a question to the whole panel. I'm wondering uh, what your view about the interaction we've seen between the Murdoch family and the BBC and the ABC and the way in which they've tried to influence the direction of both of those two bodies. Not only what it says about what their motivation might be, which is, ob is obvious, but more what it says about the fact that it seems to me that the community at large hasn't related to those arguments 
and whether that shows us the possibility of a direction for high quality uh, journalism and information that we may not have been able to, dis to discern before. I'm on the record as saying that I think the battle between public broadcasters and uh, broadcasters in inverted commas, of course, because these days they're not only broadcasting, and anybody who wants to make us pay for content is going to be one of the huge battles of the media decade. I think it will be massive and the winner, if there is a clear winner, uh, will determine a great deal of the future of media and journalism. Rupert Murdoch wants to get us to pay for content, including news content. Um, the question that we're all asking, I mean Murdoch is experimenting just as much as Swinburne University is, uh, everybody is experimenting, um, is how much will people pay and what will they pay for? And in countries like England and Australia, where we have well-funded public broadcasters, that answer will be different to what it will be in the States and in most of Europe and most of the rest of the world. Um, and so they are natural enemies. Um, and public broadcasters, which are largely reinvigorated in this environment because they're the only ones who can embrace the fragmentation of the audience, um, that they, are, they have become natural enemies. Anybody, including pay television, who wants to get us to pay, and public broadcasters, that is one of the battles. Um, but public broadcasters have never, including the ABC, have never been more dynamic and stronger. The transformation is extraordinary at the ABC, which was so much on the defensive just five or six years ago, and is now, in many ways, a le an industry leader. Which, which draws organisations like the ABC, obviously, into, into, into great conflict. And I, I think, though, that um, players like News Limited are, are a little bit late to the discussion um, and have, uh, I think, squandered a lot of the advantage they might have taken into that discussion through their practice previously. I think it's a lot of it's about um, public trust in the institutions and uh, um, the, the I mean, if, if, if the ABC was as, as sort of um, in this market as, as compromised publicly with its audience as I think is News Limited with, with, you know, through some of its manifestations in this market, then it would have a, a, a tougher road to hoe. I mean, the fact is, though, that the public broadcasters tend to be pretty fair traders and tend to have followed pretty um, sound journalistic practice and not have had to sort of compromise the sort of ethical positions that, that businesses like News Limited have had to do in the last few decades. And that's, you know, a great advantage in that, in that discussion, which is utterly willing. I think the... Um it's far easier to sustain the journalism in a publicly funded organisation like the ABC rather than a publicly listed one like News Limited or Fairfax. Publicly listed simply is code for short term <laughs> cash in quick thinking, unfortunately. Um, I think uh, kind of where you're getting to, mate, possibly, Bill, is that um, each of these organisations, ABC included, have their own vested interests and agendas they're pushing. Uh, I mean, the ABC is now pushing aggressively into, say, re regional Australia. Why? Because regional newspapers have been pretty ordinary and create an opportunity for them to come in and try and do it better. Now, arguably, they'd be better served if the ABC and Fairfax or whoever sort of did joint, joint ventures in those places so that they get the best of both worlds, but we live in hope. Um, but um, I think the issue is that the mainstream players will become inevitable because they're outside the publicly funded broadcasters will be increasingly rapacious about getting a return on their investment. That's journalism or technology or entertainment or a Fox movie or whatever it is. And if you read John Hartigan's uh, statement to his staff, I think it was last week, about where iPads are going and this is sort of the holy grail, this is going to save newspapers and journalism, there's a lot more referencing in his statement about being more engaging in a technology sense with the audience, not about the content per se. And he refers to journalism a couple of times. So we're given the benefit of the doubt, but there's a lot more of it there about news and entertainment and engagement. This is the 21st century Fox, 20th century Fox model, um, and that'll have its place. You know, Master Chef's got its place. But so too is Gourmet Magazine if it survives. So um, you know, it's, and it's up to the audience really to assign where's the value. If the value ain't there, it's like any business that goes out of business. I'm a um, graduate of 1959. <laughs> um, 
with Dalai uh, lover boys of the Western world and Western um, journalism, and with the uh, Rupert Murdoch at the background, would you like to discuss the integrity of journalism? Thank you. <laughs> Seven minutes. Two, <laughs> um, it's not at all hard at any time to talk about what's wrong with journalism. Um, this semester, the semester just finished, I've been teaching um, journalism ethics. And uh, you don't have to do too much class preparation because you know the raw material <laughs> will arrive mm -hmm. and that there will be plenty to discuss in that week's tutorial. Um, that that's extremely depressing. And one of the things which journalists who approach this debate from a conservative point of view tend to miss, I think, when they talk about things like quality control, the question we had earlier, and independence and bias, is they seem to be starting from the position that it's all been terrific until now. And of course it hasn't. Um, we have had you know, brief, not golden eras, but copper eras, <laughs> where high quality journalists who cared about what they did were able to do good work with disinterest and independence and skill. Um, those times, I think, will continue in a very different sort of fashion. But uh, there has always been, ever since journalism was invented, just as much material which for various different reasons is dubious and that's not going to change either. So it's a huge question you've asked. but. Um, it's very important not to talk as though all journalists have been terrific. What I hope is that the more collaborative and transparent relationships which are made possible by digital media will lead overall to a healthier media. Um, but it's going to take some time. <laughs> the only thing I'd add to that briefly is I think, as, uh, <coughs> as you know, Hardo sort of missive to his staff said, the journalism, journalism in his newsrooms need to become more multimedia. You've got to be able to report a story, go on air, talk about it, give a view within five minutes, because life moves on. So anything that's happening in turbo speed like that inevitably means a decline in the integrity of what's being thought about and said. Um, and uh, so you end up with the kind of a newsroom suddenly become a views room. Um, and that's fine as far as it goes, but what you end up with is a lot more heat on a topic rather than any light being shed on it, as I was trying to allude to earlier. Um, and I think you also have debate where it's manufactured conflict, black and white, he says, she says, go make up your own mind. That's, that's pretty useless, really, uh, rather than real dialogue, which is actually where you start to get to some solutions and understanding of things. So I think the integrity will shift from that kind of primary delivery of material to, to what it actually means at the end of the food chain. Uh, but there's a lot of blood on the floor before we get there. Um, I'm Betty Kaplan, freelance writer. I've been working in Africa. Um, I'm uh, very bothered about the lack of quality in writing. Um, I'm very old-fashioned. I grew up reading The Age and being absolutely inspired by it and enough to go and live in London so that I could see the theatre that I was reading about because it didn't exist here then. Um, I am very worried about the impact of um, this speed of change and um, all the blabber that, that goes on, on on the quality of writing and the disappearance of the arts. Arts is now entertainment. It isn't. For me, it's culture. It's about thought. Uh, it's about analysis. I mean, a lot of, I read newspapers ad avidly. I don't read very much analysis. I, re I, I read statements. I don't read anything that makes me think, unless I go to the New York Review of Books. Um, and uh, I've been in schoolrooms where there is, there's been everything. There have been interactive classrooms and, and whiteboards and all this sort of thing. And, and kids running around um, not knowing, not having a clue. Betty, what we've only doing. got three minutes, so if you want to get to the question. I just, my name's Jane Cannaway, I'm another freelance writer. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a point that Steve made and see if the rest of the panel agreed with him. Um, he thought that, um, that with there be increased transparency uh, and more documentation available 
my experience as a journalist has been that the opposite, that there's been more and more <coughs> stuff that is not available under freedom of information and more and more spin put out there. Um, and you may be meaning that this will change in the future, but my, my experience has been that it's only um, sites like WikiLeaks that has brought any, anything new to the table in recent years, <laughs> and that's been purely um, through anonymous um, subscribers, donations, whatever, that, which is sort of contrary to what you were saying. Yeah. Well, I, well, the point I was making, I think, was that uh, both federal government here and in other countries like the US uh, and state governments have a specific program, which is called the 2.0 program, which is to try and make more base information more available to most people. And some of that will be seem fairly trivial to some people, as in statistics about um, you know, where crime occurs or what's happening with the trains and certain stations or whatever, um, you know, right up to just sort of high-minded issues. But even at that base level, I mean, that information in the right hands is actually valuable to a certain number of people who want to know, can I get my bike on that train, yes or no? Is there going to be room? And that information suddenly becomes available and, uh, and deliverable. At the higher end, I think... You know, you're getting, getting, despite the fact that governments don't like doing this, they've actually now hung, hung their sort of um, the flag up, if you like, to say we feel compelled, just as the rest of the world is going transparent and opening up more information, and that's that new credibility of government, as it is the credibility of media, to make more information available. Um, and I think as that happens, smart media can jump on it at high level or mid level or bottom level and make something of it. I think that's that's what I was trying to get to. I think that's that's. True in part, but I think the, there's been a sort of parallel process around the, uh, the the stresses that have been put on on journalistic practice within media organisations. There's been a parallel process of the the other side of the equation lifting its game, and being more effective in the control of information and and taking advantage of the sort of the um, the problematic and and the under resourced situations in newsrooms and so on to take advantage of that moment and to sort of control what journalism produces to a greater and greater extent. I mean, the bulk of what you read and see is delivered to those news organisations by other organisations in whose vested interest it is to have you see and read it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yes, there's, there's increased mechanisms that enable transparency, but, but governments are as, as active as, as in subverting them as they are in, in promoting them. So. The battle hasn't changed, and of course, public relations preceded journalism as a profession. You know, town criers weren't employed by the public, <laughs> and they're employed by governments. Um, but, you know, I, I'm showing my age here, but when I first started to learn investigative journalism, if you wanted to do a company search or a land title search, you took a good novel down to the land titles office and waited a day. Now I can do a dozen in 10 minutes, um, and company searches likewise. Uh, it used to be a microfiche-based system, and before that, paper system, and you couldn't do a lot of the cross-matching that you can do even now. And under the Government 2.0 agenda, that's about to go phenomenally more useful. But we need the brokers. We need the information brokers. But sure, there's more spin. There certainly is more spin, but I don't think that's changed. It was always there. It's now, like everything else, very visible. Okay, time's getting away. This will be the last question, Karen. Okay, Karen Kassane from The Age. Um, I'm sitting here getting incredibly disquieted by the sort of assumption that seems to be a, um, underlining some of the comments here that the daily grunt of journalism, as Margaret calls it, can disappear as mass media fragments without there being serious consequences. And there's two things I wanted to ask you. One of the panel generally, the fact is that the blogosphere in which Jonathan and, and myself and many others find terrific commentary feeds off us. It feeds off we, what we do. It feeds off the work that we are paid to do. And did. one example of this, in terms of citizen journalists, I'm actually a little bit cynical about the ability of citizen journalists to create a sort of society-wide narrative. I've just spent 12 months doing the Royal Commission for the bushfires. It's produced more than a million pages of evidence, 20,000 pages of transcript. Sitting in there each day, it produces 200 pages of transcript and perhaps between 300 and 500 pages of exhibits. Now, it's probably cost the paper $200,000 to have a team of people covering that. What's going to happen to that kind of work if we fragment to any great degree? Will it simply not be done? And does it matter if it's not done? Absolutely, it matters. And that's why I say the, the hard and dirty work of reporting. I mean, you know, we would certainly notice the difference if investigative journalism died tomorrow, but we would notice the difference an awful lot quicker if there were no court reporters, no parliamentary reporters, no people doing that ordinary 
not particularly glamorous, sorry Karen, <laughs> not particularly glamorous, hard yakker of journalism. And it's one of the things we have to try and find a way of continuing to have. It's one of the functions. And to pay for, because citizen journalists, you might get a passionate citizen journalist who's got a particular point of view on the Bushfires Royal Commission sitting through it for however many months, but you won't get disinterested coverage, and we do need that. There, yes. is, there is a third way. I mean, you've been sitting there throughout it, but so has Jane Cowan from the ABC. So there's... And Jane Cowan has been following, I can tell you now, across online. Yeah, absolutely. Across television, across current affairs shows, and across news. And, and Jane is out there, out of the room, every Vast, vast, vastly stressed. <laughs> but the... Ten seconds, thanks, Karen. I think we should let Jonathan have a say. No, I think, I think you're absolutely right. But there are... And, and that work has to be done, and, and without that work being done, and without those bums on those seats and those courtrooms and wherever else, we would be malnourished as a society. But I'm not sure that propping up the existing journalistic models is necessarily the only way that it can be continued in the future. And don't ask me exactly what the other models are apart from public broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick comment from Steve. Uh, I remain optimistic, I guess, um, that y the point you make about the broader narrative is absolutely right. But I think to take another... And, but the problem is that that sort of investigative and investment depth is by exception, increasingly, rather than the norm, for all the reasons we've alluded to. But... And what we're talking about is that there's going to be a lot of pain before we get the new model that sustains more of it rather than less of it. But I think the other point is, if you take an issue such as um, town planning and where medium density is developed in Melbourne, you say it was 200,000 for the, for the A's to do your coverage. I'd be staggered if there were, you couldn't find 200,000 individuals in Melbourne, a city of four million, to put in a dollar to say, if someone can explain to me what decisions are being made, by who, under what influence, to what agenda, and how can I prevent something happening in my suburb that I don't like, you'll get 200 grand. And then you and a collection of others have got enough money to go and investigate it for six months. That's so I remain Ucom optimistic. <laughs> That's what Ucom News is aiming to do. <laughs> right, but, we'll finish on the ad. Well, if, <laughs> if tonight's done, uh, done nothing else, I hope it has stimulated you and uh, it's certainly given us plenty of food for thought. We've been privileged to hear such well-informed and well-argued <laughs> opinions. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in thanking Margaret Simmons, Jonathan Green and Stephen Hacks. Swinburne University of Technology.